Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Carol Wilder with the Media Studies and Film Programs uh, here to, to welcome you to this uh, premier event of the third annual Dorothy H. Hershon Film Festival. This festival is, a, is an annual series of lectures, performances, screenings, and master classes designed to promote excellence and education in the filmmaking arts. And you've probably gotten one of these, which is a schedule of the public events. There's a bunch of them outside. Dorothy uh, Hershon was a New School trustee for more than 60 years. And her generous bequest uh, of three or four years ago is what has allowed us to do this film festival. Uh, we, we hope she'd, she'd be proud. The first year was 2003, and the focus was on documentary. Our artists and residents were um, Chris Hedges and D.A. Pennybaker. Um, then last year, the focus was on independent film, and our artist and residence was the inimitable John Waters. Um, the focus, oh, I, we didn't think it could be more fun, but I think it is. You know? um, the focus of this year's Hershon Festival is experimental media, and we're honored to welcome Laurie Anderson as our artist in residence. I imagine that most of us would be satisfied to be accomplished in any one field as an artist, a musician, a composer, a choreographer, a poet, a filmmaker, a techno wizard. Laurie Anderson is all of these and more. But beyond the formidable professional body of work, um, with which you're probably familiar if you're here, I want to add that uh, Laurie is so nice <laughs> and uh, so funny and, and so enchanting that you know upon meeting her that some special force of nature has entered your life. Friends, colleagues, and neighbors, Lori Anderson herself. Thank you so much. Um, I want to uh, thank uh, all of the people here uh, who um, helped organize this week because for me it's a really great opportunity to not just um, hang around for one night but to really sort of develop things over a few days and so um, I'm going to kind of pick up uh, where I stopped uh, yesterday which was um, uh, and tonight I'm going to be talking about a, a few um, recent projects and uh, one will, uh, was something that I just completed, which was um, a series of things that I worked on in Japan. And uh, also I'll be talking about a little bit of my time as um, artist in residence at NASA, which I've done for a couple of years. And some, a bit about some recent walking projects. And then I'm going to show bits from a traveling exhibition of my work about um, sound. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about stories and how I'm learning really about what they are and developing a way of kind of using language um, through a series of things about uh, really uh, talking animals, really. And um, so I'm going to tell you some stories about how that type of language is being um, developed. And I'm going to do this in three parts, and, and I realize that an evening like this is really um, a bit on the long side, so there'll be little short breaks between uh, sections, and those of you who uh, need to can uh, slip out. Now, in the first part, will be about um, uh, the projects in Japan, and I'll show you uh, some pictures and... Um, a short 25-minute uh, film. And uh, the next part will be about all the other things. And then the last will be a, a kind of Q&A, which I'm, I'm really looking forward to. Because um, in uh, much of the things that I do, it, it really is, um, uh, I, I try for, for a sense of um, back and forth um, of both sides and, and, and dialogue. So I'm... I'm um, Looking forward to what you have uh, to say and talk about at that point. Um, now, as a multimedia artist, it's 
I'm always kind of attempting to try to um, put these various projects together in some ways. And so I'm going to show you how that um, has worked out. And even though they're uh, really pretty different kinds of projects, there's some odd links between them. And, and I know that um, most of you are artists, and so I'm going to try to look at these things a bit differently than I normally uh, would. So anyway, I'm, I'm going to begin by showing you uh, some pictures of uh, a, a project that I was doing in uh, Japan. And this started two years ago when I was asked to come to uh, Japan to talk about doing some concerts at um, Expo, which was going to be uh, in Nagoya, uh, near Nagoya in a town, Aichi province. And anyway, they, they said, oh, we'd like you to come in and do some concerts and could you come and look at the theaters? And I said, you know, well, um, you could just send me like the plans, you know, I could read the plans and that, because it was so, such a long way to Tokyo. And, um, they said, well, why don't you come anyway? And we haven't built the theaters yet, but you can, we can look at where they're going to be. And so um, I didn't have anything better to do, really, so I, I went. And I was really impressed with what they were doing there. there good it's, a, in a way, a typical expo. It just opened like a couple of weeks ago. And um, its, its theme is um, the wisdom of nature. And... Uh, they were building a lot of, they were going to build a lot of things, and one was a Japanese garden. And I was really, really impressed by that because I've, I've been trying to, uh, very hard in the last two years, to get away from computers and from staring at rectangles and thinking that actually things could be crammed into those, that little shape. I know it's like a, an ad here. <laughs> um, because it just uh, it just doesn't fit mostly, you know. It, it's um, and all of my life now has been um, squeezed into these boxes. And so, in the interest of trying to think of of um, scale and other uh, things, I I um, let's see. Oh, okay. Um, have uh, I, I decided to do things that were mostly outside. So they were, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures from the B, when I first went there a couple of years ago in the spring, and they were working on this place. And um, I love taking on projects like this because it meant that I had to learn um, a lot about what a Japanese garden was. And so um, that to me was really exciting because I, I really knew nothing. and. Uh, there are, of course, a lot of... Um, so this is when they're first beginning to sort of sandbag legs and really reshape the whole place. And um, the uh, and protecting absolutely every little tiny, uh, even half-living thing. They would just kind of shrink wrap and while they worked around it. And it was really... It's, it's a very, very beautiful sight. And so one of the things that uh, I learned about um, Japanese gardens was that you really... Um, uh, it's the classic ones, you know, the, the, the word for garden is really uh, setting stones. Uh, so these aren't really uh, classically an English garden or trees and grass and stuff like that. I th think more like Stonehenge and um, this kind of zone where, a special zone where it's kind of marked out and where you can work out uh, ideas of uh, good and evil, really. It's that kind of zone. And a lot of these ideas came from China of how to create this place that was a sort of mock-up of the world and, and what its, its guardians were, these animal guardians of a turtle, a dragon, a bird, and a tiger. And they were at each, um, on each side of this um, squarish um, uh, zone as a sort of feng shui uh, protection. Um, the experience of working with the Japanese team was really unique, I have to say, uh, because I think of my... Oh, this is an old um, Japanese garden that they uprooted and to um, make this new one. Uh, I thought that I was a really hard worker until I started working in Japan. And the, you know, from the from for the last two years, you know, every time I would go there, the first meeting was basically, you know, at um, baggage claim, and then the next one would be the meeting to prepare for the breakfast meeting. You know, I, I was like, you know, 
very, very extreme work ethic. And I, uh, I found that really um, daunting. I, mean, I, felt, I, I felt like such a slacker the entire time. And um, anyway, they, uh, also, the, I have to say that the, I had never felt uh, more far away from my own uh, base and ideas about what, let's say, beauty was, or let's say, what... Um, what a lot of things were. And I learned that um, most often from tra translation, and trying to translate things from um, English to Japanese. So for example, when I was working with uh, one translator, I was working on a story about justice and um, revenge. And um, he was saying, um, well, you have to understand that when you say, uh, justice, we uh, say harmony. And I was like, whoa, that's <laughs> extreme. And when you say individual rights, we think individual responsibilities. And, um, or for example, if there were an argument between our team, the American team, and the Japanese team, they would never say, you know, like, Akira is angry. They would say, um, there is anger in this room. You know, no one's going to claim it. It was like so. It was, it was, um, and I happen to think that I, I I gravitate towards that a little bit more than I do from my own side of the world, which is um, the more or less the what we got from the Greeks, heroes and egos and me and what I think and me and me and me and so. I, when I saw that being more porous, I thought that is what it's like. It's more like. Yeah, the phone rings and it could be for you and could not be and you know like you're more tapped in to to things than you think and um, So I I was very very um, uh, I found that very inspiring the guy who designed this garden is named Wakui san and uh, Mr. Wakui and he imported hundreds of thousands of giant boulders from all over Aichi and and came up with this idea to do a Wagnerian story, an opera in water and rocks. And that was his idea, to tell the story. Now the story of, a, of this particular province, Aichi, is one of, one of rushing water. And it's very frustrating. The water comes down from the mountains, rushes through the rice paddies without really sinking in and out to the ocean. So whoa, it's this kind of thing, you can't catch it, you know. So uh, his uh, story was, um, uh, let's see if we get to that in a second, is um, one that uh, is about that kind of um, passing through. So in, eventually his garden, which he described as a, as a, as a dragon, um, begins in a very peaceful way and then builds up to this Wagnerian finale of very, very sharp and rigid rocks. Anyway, I, I made several proposals when I was there a couple of years ago and I said, well, I'd like to do some concerts and then I'd like to do some music that you'd hear in the garden as you walk through it and then also some um, visual installations in the garden and also a film and so, uh, and I'm, and it was one of these times where you don't have much to do and so I made a big booklet as a proposal and, and sent it to them and then I forgot about it and six months after that, um, they said, well, we'd like to do your, your projects. And I was like, uh-oh, because, you know, there's a lot of things you can do in Photoshop that you can't do in, in our world. <laughs> and, and I'd gotten a little carried away with the, well, let's just do this. And so I proposed about 200 projects to them, uh, of which we built, I'll show you, four in the end. <laughs> but um, along the way, um, so I'll just show you what what these look like, and they were some attempts to be in the spirit of of um, a couple of things of um, uh, of of this garden, and also a bit in in haiku, and in haiku in the sense that it is very much trying to be in the present tense. So present tense flows through these, these projects because uh, I'd gotten really very tired with a lot of other kind of let's say poetry that was always going back or forward or comparing things to something else and it was never, nothing was ever what it was and so I really liked it when poems the, with such a rigid structure could just say this is it for this moment right now and I found that really breathtaking and um, 
So I'm going to show you some of these projects, and I want to say that um, feel free to use any of them if you uh, need them, because they're all uh, up for grabs at the moment. So um, this first one was a um, little weather islands that would be floating along streams, and this was sort of inspired by this idea that um, the um, if you were sending love notes to someone else and in the garden you would like throw the note into the fast moving stream and pick it up on the, on the end and this is um so these are little uh, screens that would represent uh that day's weather and they would be uh images that are floating this is a um a, a screen that is a constantly redrawing of itself chalk drawing so you, you hear this kind of you know, chalk kind of like constantly doing that, and and it's drawing the scene in in front of it. So it's a, all of these are, um, as you can imagine, um, kind of uh, R and D heavy. You know, <laughs> this one is a uh, haiku stick, and with lots of um, uh, different little uh, poems on them, all distributed through the landscape. Um, this was hundreds of little, tiny, tiny, tiny video screens that would be kind of... Uh, this is one of my favorite places in the world of where one um, uh, thing meets another. And I, I love these kind of no, no man's lands of like, um, let's say, where the garden meets the forest or the town meets the, the prairie. And it's usually where you put, you know, the, the, the town dump or whatever. And in this case, so it's, it's this kind of eerie place that um, isn't quite there. And so that was, was about that kind of border. This is um, some images that I wanted to use that were, would be from Mars. Now, this is when I was trying to, like, connect some of these projects. Um, and... Uh, I spent, as I said, the last couple of years being the artist in residence for NASA and and watching these um, robot rovers kind of get off the ground and, and start walking around and kind of, kind of thinking, not really thinking, kind of calculating. And it was really a very exciting to watch robots do that. So um, the uh, one of the classic garden texts uh, in Japan is, yeah, don't forget to go to the new school. <laughs> I'll try to turn those off. I have other reminders to myself that <laughs> you might not want to be reminded of. Um, uh, let's see. So, um, this classic text is uh, something by um, Dogen, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. He's a 13th century Japanese Zen master who wrote a very beautiful book called um, uh, Enlightenment Unfolds, and the central question of this book is, um, are mountains aware? And he goes through this question, and I know it's what constitutes consciousness. I mean, is it really... Um, when you have this sense of nature as, a, as really kind of alive, does that include this kind of awareness as well? And it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, book. And in case you're looking for a good spring book, this is a, this is one of them. And and so I thought, well, this is an interesting um, uh, kind of uh, mirror of what's going on with NASA. You know, looking for. Uh, life on another planet, and particularly water, which seemed very germane to what was going on in Aichi with its whole story of water. Now they were looking for water, looking for life. At that point, there were three missions on their way to Mars, a British one, a Japanese, and American. And so when I proposed using some of these images and putting them into the mud in, in Aichi, they said, well, okay, here's the objection to this project, this one. The, we would prefer to use the images from the, the Japanese mission. So, okay, you know, I mean, I'm not like really patriotic. I think, you know, unless the, you know they have other kinds of filters that they're using, you know, it's it's fine with me. But that was that was um, the problem with this particular project that it was it needed to be um, Japanese images. Now, um, it's really hard to get to Mars. It's really far away. It's really hard to like. Just, and of course, the British mission went off, and so did the Japanese. They didn't get there, and and um, we got there. And so, uh, by that point, it was you know it was too, of course, humiliating for them to even discuss. So um, that was the end of this particular one. 
I, I like to include a few super low-tech uh, uh, things. So this is just a, a hollow tube that you look through. And um, I love this uh, uh, idea that you can look into another world. And the, the aquascope is a, a, a way to do that, just pierce the surface and look down into another place. Um, this is uh, some, some images that were to be on the bottom of a bridge we, with the idea that, um, of reflection, because in one of the tenets of, uh, of gardens was that um, it is, uh, according to the designer, was, was that it's, it's kind of rude to look like directly at a flower. So, you know, it's much more polite to look at the reflection of the flower. So I thought, okay, I, I like that idea. That's like, um, I, so this was a, an attempt to try to um, uh, look at that thing. This is a six-sided six film called Box of Birds, and it would um, be kind of animation of birds kind of rushing around and then turning into just a single one and then lots of birds. This is um, some frames because a lot of um, the garden ideas were also very much about framing and always looking at being able to place it in, um, in a rectangle. And as much as I tried to get away from rectangles, there they were again. You know? so this was a way to, uh, you were going to look at these, um, that scene through a various uh, time lapse seasons of the same image. So you'd see those trees. Uh, in cherry blossom time and snow and, and whatever else. Um, I, these were a series of um, sort of dummy rocks that I, uh, would be rocks that would have images projected from the inside so that they would turn these other sort of into other kind of materials like porcelain or you know coal or something. That they would slowly um, mutate into other uh, uh, textures and so-called materials. This uh, these are some binoculars that would add things to the landscape as opposed to take them away and various kind of hellish scenes. It was, you know, it got, it, it got more and more that way as the project went on. Um, this is like a little kind of Dharma wheel that you, it's like a little Ferris wheel that goes on the bottom of the, of the water, of the little ponds. And um, you have these little, uh, you have a wheel on the edge of the, the shore uh, that you turn and, and objects sort of pop up as as you as you turn the wheel. Um, I'm going to look. We're going to look now at a few things that um, were uh, part of the completed project. And um, as I said, Expo opened um, uh, two weeks ago in Aichi, and so this was in the back of these. It's um, uh, is the um, pavilion of Aichi, and where some of the um, where the garden was, and at the these um, panels, these silver panels are um, boxes. Really, are, are part of an infrared system that I worked on with a, um, a Japanese company, uh, so that these we you hold a little like a bamboo credit card up to your ear, and you hear greetings um, in Chinese, Japanese, French, and English to the park, and these are. These um, to the garden, and these were um, uh, not, uh, you know, completely uh, in on this infrared system. And these are um, so one of the parts of this was called walk, and this is um, one of the uh, walking figures. Now I have to tell you one other. We're lucky to get this uh, image in, in sort of embossed there because. We had proposed, you know, little hemispheres of, of plastic or glass, and um, we, they came back with a, a series that says we'd ha we've had some meetings about this. And the problem with these hemispheres of glass is that we feel that they will heat up the air in front of the glass, and that the visitors could potentially be seriously burned as they walk by. And I'm thinking, I'm working with insane people. This is like, who came up with this? Like, this is not going to heat up the air in front of this this little piece of plastic, you know. So I'm thinking, wow, this is so out, you know. I was uh, began to really enjoy it at that point, you know, in a certain <laughs> kind of way. So um, these are also the four little symbols of um, the the guardians of the garden. The this is the phoenix, and the tiger, 
And as you walk through, and the garden is really just starting to come out now, if you're going to be in Japan over the summer, um, check it out, because it really is um, going to be very beautiful. Um, just to show you some scenes as you walk through. This was a, um, a little symbol of a tiger, and it was a... Uh, well, actually, this is the another bridge, dragon bridge, which has an image projected under it. Um, which was uh, what was left over from the the screen under the bridge. So you see these kind of uh, changed as they went. Um, this is a drawing in in uh, in trees that uh, only turns into this uh, tiger from a single point of view. So um, from a very short, this is really kind of for children, and you can and otherwise it looks like just a you know vague scribbling. Um, beautiful, beautiful trees that are, are, are coming up in a, in a way of using them uh, architecturally that's, that um, I think is, uh, I found very, very inspiring. And um, here we come to the more Wagnerian part of the garden in which it, uh, he actually uses like theatrical fog to um, stream through this part of the garden. And it's... Um, uh, tries to represent this um, excitement of uh, flowing water. We're coming to another little um, uh, building which was, is going to be there after uh, this exhibition is over as well, a little azomayo, which just means little little building, uh, like, a, like a kind of a gazebo sort of thing to rest as you walk through the park. And inside is something that's called a word fall, which is... Um, there, these uh, little phrases uh, uh, in Japanese fall on. Oh, I didn't get this. Shoot this very well. Um, uh, travel down these panels and fall into a uh, a kind of screen pool uh, in which they're translated into to English. So um, it's called um, word fall, and. Then there's another one, which is um, uh, Turtle Bridge, which is, is a very sort of simple idea, but I really enjoyed the um, the final version of this. They're just little speakers underneath this bridge, and as you walk across it, there's these uh, kind of gong clusters uh, of sound. Um, let's see, so the, uh, a couple other images here. And then... This is again a little bit of more of an overview of, of where, where the garden is in there. And then um, also made a, a film of, um, called Hidden Inside Mountains that we're going to look at in a minute. And this um, really started out, I was making a film many years ago in Japan that I never really finished. And it was um, I shot from, I was really involved, interested in shooting from very steep angles and down onto things. I just um, was getting very bored with this sort of straight on um, vision and box like thing. And so these are all, were all very steep. And um, so this um, film uh, went through a series of like sort of strange stages. I, I, when I look at it now, I, I, I I, f I think of it as um, uh, really little fables. I think uh, it had it went through a number of of um, different um, incarnations. But it's uh, it and also that was um, inspired by uh, sort of as an attempt at trying to be as present tense as possible. So this was. Um, is shown, this film is shown uh, uh, every night and, uh, at Expo for the next few weeks and on a big AstroVision screen. So it's um, a very large sort of projection system. And um, so uh, we're going to take a look at this film. It's about 25 minutes long. And then right after that, we'll take just a very short break. So uh, if you would please... Um, uh, show the film. Thanks. Thank you. This is the actually the first um, 
public uh, screening of, of the film, and I, I've noticed uh, several of the people who uh, worked on it are here tonight, and I want to thank them so much because it was um, quite a, a, a uh, an uh, effort to uh, from lots of different um, departments to kind of put it together. We shot this um, at uh, not so far from here, at um, in the Oxygen uh, Studios over in the West Village, and at a time when I was working on um, a something called the End of the Moon, which is a was a performance work, and so they share some of the same sort of ideas, but. Um, one of the things that I, I had mentioned translation before, and and the, one of the translators who was working with me on this uh, kept asking me um, uh, about one of the uh, well about a lot of the text. And he was saying, you know, what, what you know, what did you mean by this or that? And and one of the pieces that you saw was, um, you know, I um, was. Uh, uh, I had thought I had lost something, but I, I just couldn't put my finger on what what it was. And I, uh, anyway, he's saying, "Well, what was it that you lost?" And I said, "You know, I just things. You know, how you feel when you lose things." And he, he said, "No, but I mean, what exactly were you talking about? And and when did you write it?" And I said, "Well, um, actually, I wrote it when we uh, invaded Iraq, and uh, what I lost was uh, my country." And um, I hadn't realized that at all because, and I had just, on the other hand, put it next to an iconic image of Japan, Fuji, you know. And this translator said, you know, when we hear about, you know, losing something and we see an image like that, we think of losing our place, losing what, where we are, who we think we are. And I, I realized how much I work on, on, uh, on things without really uh, knowing exactly what they are, and I have to say that I, I really, um, I, at this point, uh, kind of trust that a lot more than I used to. You know, and I don't mind being like a kind of idiot, not knowing what I'm doing. Uh, it's, it's, um, I kind of gravitate towards things that are a little bit. Um, uh, undefined and I, I know I'm not the only person in this country who feels a little uneasy about things and it's um, hard to, it's a very unpopular position obviously to talk about disappointment and um, and uh, so it was the whole thing was sort of dropped in last fall, it just didn't happen somehow and so I um, I'm always um, drawn to something that, that has this feeling of like very hard to uh, sort of uh, articulate, let's say. And um, and I, I couldn't even articulate it at all. In fact, I was talking all around it. But um, anyway, this was, uh, this is the point, uh, one of the points where you can slide out of here. So we won't turn the house lights on, but if you need to go, um, I won't be offended. Um, anyway, uh, I'm just going to continue though. This um, um, piece called The End of the Moon was a, a work that was um, nominally about a particular thing which was my uh, experience as artist in residence at NASA. And so it was also a, a kind of um, way for me to figure out what uh, I was sort of looking for. And I realized in, in talking to a lot of researchers at NASA that they had similar problems, that um, they uh, weren't all that sure either what exactly what they were looking for. And um, in the sense that, um, let's say for example, the best example of this I think is Einstein, when he said, um, you know, that he was rejecting some of his major theories. Why? Because they weren't beautiful. And I'm thinking, what's he looking for then? You know, I mean, but, uh, based on what? And so I, and also in, in working in Japan too, I found that, you know, a lot of things that we consider are like real, um, uh, serious requirements for beautiful things are, like let's say symmetry, are considered in Japan like 
kind of moronic, you know. Like, that looks like that, well, what, so what? You know, that's supposed to make it great, you know? It's, it's just, they, they're just two matching things, left and right. Um, and so, the, uh, uh, also, in a, yeah, I talked to a lot of people who um, were uh, not, uh, we're doing a lot of the same kind of guesswork that I do as an artist, working on sort of hunches and then kind of uh, trying to figure out how to fill in the blanks. And, and um, so, uh, the, uh, for example, there were some people that I met that were talking about um, uh, the 90% of the universe that we can't see. And First, I mean, my first question would be, are you sure that it's 90% that you can, I mean, based on, you know? So, um, and they're, they're, they have been from the NASA, they love like acronyms, and so they were saying, well, okay, the, what we're gonna call the more active particles in this invisible universe are gonna be uh, machos, so, for more active or something particles, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the less active particles are going to call wimps. And I'm thinking, yeah, you know, did, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger write your grant proposal, guys, because <laughs> you're you haven't even seen this, and you're willing to say that about you know what you have never you know. So anyway, um, but one of the things that I I liked the most about uh, was spooking around it. Uh, so I was meeting people that I would never meet here. And for example, like in robotics, there was one guy who, um, uh, and, I, and the, well, I should, I should go back to say how that started, which was like a call from nowhere. This guy who says, would you like to be NASA's first artist in residence? And uh, I thought he was joking. I thought, you know, so I, you know, thought he was a fan or something. So I just didn't, you know, hung up the phone on him. and. <laughs> He kept calling back, and I said, "You yeah, know, you're not from NASA. Come on!" And he was, you know, and and so I said, "You know, what does an artist in residence do?" And he said, uh, "He he didn't know, but uh, what did I think an artist in residence would do?" It was that kind of conversation, and uh, so uh, in the end, I just decided to go around and look at all the NASA sites, start there, and see what they were doing. And so I went to Hubble and Ames and Jet Propulsion Lab and Pasadena and Mission Control and a lot of, a lot of places to, to see what was happening. And, and, I, and so some of the people I met, for example, I was talking about this robotics guy, he had designed, his job was design vehicles that went really, 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 really fast. And on the lunch hour in this um, lab, he had brought one of these really fast vehicles into the middle of this room and he was like, talking about it, jumping up and down, going, this is, this is, and suddenly he was on top of the hood, you know, still doing this, and I didn't even know how he got there, you know, it was like, you know, it's, and he was the kind of guy who was like, like an ex-Navy SEAL and, you know, um, mountaineer, and his, he had just come back from rescuing, uh, well, his friend had uh, climbed a mountain in a snowstorm and died in a cave, and this guy went up to in the same storm that was still going on, up the mountain into the cave to bring his friend's body down. You know, this kind of guy. And um, it was, uh, just don't meet this kind of people in, you know, like New York, in my world in New York, the you know, art world, music world, and um, different kind of, you know, bravery going on here. But it was uh, very fascinating to, you know, could just jump out of your orbit and, and realize that there's, a lot of other stuff uh, going on in a lot of different uh, ways. Um, I want to go back to uh, looking at some images, and uh, let's see. Get that. Oh, uh, let's see. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk then about. Um, uh, some a uh, couple of other projects that um, I've been doing, and one uh, was, uh, as I said, I've been trying to avoid um, doing uh, a lot of uh, 
uh, big multimedia things because I um, and things having to do with computers and I've been trying to do things that um, let me be outside and and uh, and really that's because you know I I don't really uh, know uh, what I'm doing yeah, at all uh, as a person or as an artist so. I um, try to, uh, I'm trying to kind of get out of this whatever trap, I don't know even what it is. And um, I, what happened really was, um, you know, I was doing a lot of things and, and going to a lot of places, you know, trying to, oh, I'll go there and if I just get that thing done, then, then, then I can go and get that other thing done and, you know, then I can get that thing done. and, and um, Maybe then that will happen, and it was this, you know, this arrangement of this, you know, uh, carrot and a donkey kind of arrangement of luring yourself, you know, into the future was just, I'll just do this and then I'll do that, and then you kind of, and what happened really was, you know, like my donkey died, you know, <laughs> just said, so what if you get there and do that, <laughs> you know, you're using that cool technology to do it, I was like, wow, you know, I just, you know, I thought, I just don't, really don't get it. And, and so, uh, there's a lot of advantages to not knowing what you're doing, a lot. Uh, because then you have to like just, you know, um, improvise. And, and that's, uh, I found that that's really uh, uh, been really interesting. And so, uh, and, and also a little bit confusing sometimes. Like for example, I was asked to for the uh, Olympics, come to work on the um, uh, the opening ceremony and and to help design that and and um, I was brought in as this you know high tech artist who could do all this blah, st you know the stuff and they were showing me what they were going to do and it was all like you know it was. I was like the consultant from hell, really, um, because every time they would say, "Oh, we're going to bring this giant crane in, and this is going to like," I could say, you know, I wouldn't do that, you know. And <laughs> this other thing is, you know, and then we're going to do this, and I was like, I, I'd skip that thing, you know. And and they finally like, well, what would you do? And I was like, well, you know, you have this. Like, I I really felt very strongly about this that that you know, um, everybody's doing a multimedia show every fashion company, every car company, everybody's like in, so you push a button and wow, something happens. You know, I just don't see the point, you know? I really genuinely don't. I like technology as much as anybody, but I, you know, I don't like, uh, uh, you know. So I was saying, you know, you people, you you invented this, um, everything here, you know, there's such a quick uh, amount of time, you know, and why don't you, you know, philosophy, tragedy, architecture, ethics, you know, physics, blah, 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 you know, um, why don't you just, you know, you have this big field just emblazoned, you know, know thyself. That's one of the really hard things to do. And they're like, well, okay, you're hired. And I said, no, I'm not, I don't want to, you know. So anyway, I did work with them for, about a year and a half, and it was one of the greatest experiences of my life because I've never been with people that smart. Yeah, it was shocking. I mean, I think English is an incredibly beautiful language, so slinky and you know, full of things that mean 20 things. That's another thing that makes it very hard to translate stuff. It's like, you say, well, do you want it to mean this or that? And you go, well, well how about both? Couldn't it mean that and 10 other things too? And they no, no, take your pick. And so. English is full of, of all of these, you know, um, just fluffy things, and so um, it's uh, anyway. The, however, uh, and I don't at all speak Greek, but I had the feeling that it was it was a very very sharp tool because when we would talk about something, they would go, "Well, let's look at it from this angle," and I could think that angle, I didn't even know it had that dimension, you know, so it was very exciting to kind of turn things around like that. Um, along the way, when I was there, and I had to be very secretive about this, because you have to sign about a million things, saying you're not, you, you never met these people, you're not, never, you know, so I would just go off to Athens and people would go, where are you going? And I'd go, 
I never had like a good answer. I'm just I'm leaving town for a while, and you know, so, you know. Anyway, I had an apartment in Athens, and I would um, look out at the Parthenon every day, and it was really staggering. And the, at that point, I was had been asked by a Buddhist magazine to write this essay about time and beauty, modestly titled "Time and Beauty," and so I, I was looking at this building every day and, and we had some kind of coaches on Greek um, culture at the time and, and one of them was the guy who was fixing the Parthenon and he's the guy who's like gluing it back particle by particle and it's going to take 500 more years and he would give us tours and talk about what it was going on there and um, the thing he looked is he looked exactly like Plato and so you had to take him like really seriously, you know, he would go, well then I think that, well, and, uh, well, the busts of Plato, you know, as much as we know, of, who knows what, what the guy looked like. Um, he looked like the busts of Plato, I should say. And uh, so I said, I have a question for you. Like, um, so all of this stuff happens at here in this short period of time. Why didn't it just keep going? You know, why didn't it just, it, you know, get more and more? Why didn't it expand and explode and become this just giant, you know, uh, explosion of energy and 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 trying to find things? What ha what happens here? You know, he said, well, his theory was this that um, so people would come to the Parthenon to worship Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, and they would bring these things to. Uh, help their prayers along, and so uh, big statues, kuros, and they they became it became a little bit competitive in a way. People would bring they would become more and more elaborate these statues until they became like really incredible works of art, and they were parked all around the Parthenon, just sort of like you know completely helter skelter, no not curated, you know, just kind of you know, and and so it was like just what he said was people came there and they said, you know, um, uh, it was more like a, like a lot of art. And they said, well, you know, I, I, I can't pray in an art museum. And I thought, oh, wow, that's a, <laughs> really something to say. And they, they would go back into the, like the, where the gods came from, the groves and, the, you know, the rivers and all of those places where uh, they had originated. And uh, I thought, can it be that you know uh, this um, that believing in something or, or having that kind of faith in something just completely is so would wipe out this other impulse? So anyway, um, it was something that um, really uh, haunted me and that I really wanted to to work on. And at that t time, I was also trying to design these um, series of of uh, walks and they were just like again as i said i just have to for no better reason than i had to get out of here and 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 they were sort of based on this idea that jean jacques rousseau had had about um taking uh one idea and trying to to walk the idea you know think, think walk to a place that had something to do with that idea and think about it on the way the trouble with me is when i went on these 10 day walks or so my mind would just go blank, you know, I couldn't follow an idea from what, it wasn't a, a kind of narrative map for me of like thinking something through and walking somewhere, so. Um, but it came uh, also really out of um, a project that French Radio had asked me to do, which is a, a diary, an audio diary, and I, I had finished this, we had recorded stuff every day and then did these kind of links, it's actually something I'm finishing now, but at the time that I had finished recording, I I was in Milan and I thought, you know, like, I, keeping a diary was, is, is sort of like walking because you really don't know what's going to happen in your life next to the way you, it, it is when you're taking a walk, unless you have this kind of life that's all totally planned out and you just, you know, go from one thing to another. And um, so I thought, well, I'll go and I'll... I have to mix this in Paris, so maybe I'll just walk to Paris. And so this is my this first walk idea. And a little problem, however, with the, you know, Alps. So, 
uh, I was thinking, what are other ways to get into that city, which is, has, like many major cities, m major spokes coming out and into it, and most of them have to do with a, with a pilgrim sort of kind of a, idea of, of gravitating towards something or needing to get somewhere, I have to have to get somewhere, and this kind of goal-oriented behavior is something that I was really, really trying to um, uh, avoid, try to, trying to go the other way, and um, so I'm asking, so though, many of those routes are like shard, so you, you know, kind of crawl from, you know, uh, the, 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 the shrine or whatever to Paris and back. So, uh, um, a friend of mine whose name is Chris Marker, a filmmaker whose work you might know, uh, La Jete, is one of my favorite works of his, um, suggested a, a route which was um, to go from Charleville to Paris, uh, just to, because it was his hometown, also Rambeau's hometown. Town. And um, uh, Rambeau, who wrote such beautiful things about walking and freedom. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll try to um, and he was always like running away from Charlotte because it was a really horrible little town. And so um, I thought I'll, you know, go on this kind of runaway road. Um, by then it's like getting like really too cold to walk anywhere, and so I had to like, postpone it. But I did. I have since then um, uh, wanted to do this really particularly because another reason was because at that point. Um, uh, President Bush was talking a lot about um, uh, the founding f fathers of the country, and he he kept talking about how they were like men of great religious belief. And you know, I'm thinking, wait a second, you know, that, <laughs> the whole point of uh, th these guys were, were were really trying to separate uh, church and state. They weren't like trying to blend it. And what's he talking about? And 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 the people who founded the United States were. They were men of the Enlightenment. They were reading Diderot. They were reading Voltaire. They wanted to cut those connections. They wanted to really try to uh, make that quite clear. Not uh, and so uh, I, it made me want to more and more walk through France. You know, just with this idea of liberty, really, and freedom. It's a place where really they kind of reinvented it after us you know more than a thousand years. What it would mean to be f really free. What does it mean to be free? And so I thought, um, problem is, of course, you know, an American walking through the countryside of France, you know, we're, you know, we're not that welcome, you know, I have to say. So um, I thought, well, maybe if I brought, like, my dog, uh, who has, like, a French kind of name, Lola Belle, because they really like dogs a lot, and, um, you know, get a couple, like, little berets and baguettes, you know. Bonjour, you know, just passing through, you know, it's, uh, uh, we haven't done that walk yet, but um, I'm going to show you a couple of quick pictures of some walks that I, I've done. Um, and this one is along the Ridgeway that started on Avebury, and, and this is a beautiful part in, in Wiltshire in the south of England. And it's like walking along, it's a, a top of a ridge, you walk all the way along the top of the ridge. It starts in, in this more or less place, Avebury, that makes Stonehenge look kind of like newish. And um, these, this was uh, about this time last year, a little later than this. So starting off in Avebury, and this goes along a, a kind of very thin ridge on top of these mountains that fall away and on either side. And you, so this was the the uh, road that you took when you were you know taking your sheep and goats to market, so that you could see who's sneaking up on you from either side. And it's also where they have the white horses um, in the in the side of the hills, although they look, you can see one from here. This is taken with a really tiny, tiny, uh, like, spy camera. And the horses, which really look exactly like dragons. I mean, they don't look a thing like horses. And um, these brilliant fields. And this, this is a, a walk that um, was designed, uh, I, I had asked uh, some uh, English friends to design walks for me, and this was uh, designed by Brian Eno. So, uh, and he decided it was looked like so much fun that he came along. So he came along, and, and we um, stopped at a lot of churches in this one because of one of the projects that he and I are both involved in, called the project, you know, the, the Long Now, which is 
designing a clock that will ring every thousand years, and it's now been um, it's been built a couple times because the first time it, it broke after like a year. <laughs> Not a good sign. Uh, this is a, this is a clock that was is without a face, and there's this complicated poem about a clock without a face, a church without a steeple, and a clock without a face, and so on, that we came across. And this is um, what was going on in uh, Wiltshire. This is. Um, <laughs> This guy was outraged, you know. Um, I took uh, one of the other walks was a kind of fate walk. I walked from Athens to Delphi, which was kind of it was a sort of pilgrimage walk in a certain way, leaving from the Acropolis and walking out through um, the olive groves around and and. Um, this is, of course, the the walk where you go to the Oracle of Delphi, and he tells you what's going to happen. And and it's, it was in certain ways, in certain parts of it, a very ugly walk down by the port, by Piraeus, through lots of like um, kind of places where tankers were coming in and super highways. And and this means sacred way on the top. This is what the sacred way looks like at this point. And um, so through these um, play, Hotel Niobe, which is sleep, and, and passing by these places like, you know, the crossroads where Oedipus killed his father, you know, and you're thinking, the crossroads, the Oedipus, the father, you know, this is kind of really mind-boggling. Um, this is, uh, a lot of people were killed along this road, so there were a number of shrines, and the paint had kind of worn off, so they became very ghost-like, and... Um, more and more mountainous, more and more rocky, and I was also working on this, you know, rock garden idea in Japan, so rocks were like, I was just getting very abstract, you know, look though, kind of like starting to lose it. it, was, you know, there's a giant eye in the sky, better take a picture, a giant whale, oh my god, better, better take another picture. Um, there was a very beautiful place in, um, uh, not really in any guidebooks. It, it was near Arahova, and it's this an ancient spring and and uh, crumbly old temple, and the water is still pouring out of the ground, just flooding all the fields, and you can still see the structure of of the of the um, of the pools that they had made for uh, the and the. Um, and the trees that are, all, all the water trees that are growing up around there, they, these natural springs. And again, the, sort of the, this, this part of town that I really like, just sort of the dumping grounds part of town. Um, and then, uh, really, by the time I got to uh, Delphi, you know, after these kind of like rock arrangements all over the place, just sort of strewn, by the time I got here, it didn't look that different, you know, than the other sort of like more unorganized things. So this was um, uh, Delphi. And then, uh, this is something I was going to mention later, but I'll, this is a place I took my dog to learn to talk with her. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in a second, in uh, the headlands of California. Um, and last uh, of these walks is something that I did last week on the Kumano Kodo uh, in, in Japan, which is a very um, uh, thousand-year-old sort of pilgrim route uh, along the eastern coast of Japan. And it um, just it looks exactly like that, just many, many cedars. We're the only people on this um, uh, route through cedars and uh, bamboo stands, and these paths that are, are completely crumbling. Lots of monkeys there, you dip down to that, we stayed in like just like fishing village places. And um, and so, but mostly it was way, way uh, up walking on this um, ridge. And the these are, this is, I didn't get any pictures of the monkeys, but we got stoned by them several times, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, little uh, shrines like this. So these, these really, but walking in this kind of pilgrimage was so odd because there was no real start and there was no real end. I mean, and also it was the, 
Japanese interpretation of Buddhism, which is much, much more ascetic than, the, than its sources. So the idea that someone would spend 10 years in a little cave about the, this big made sense to them, you know, and they would just, um, uh, this is a, a crest of a mountain where, um, crest of a, two, two paths where the, supposedly the male and the female sort of meet and you, you uh, it either it looks like some people didn't want to make that transition, <laughs> left their walking sticks and went back. But um, uh, it's more monkey uh, material. And um, and these, uh, this is the most, most that there was of a marker uh, that was left of that. Um, I want to show you also really quickly, just because I, I got a chance to see um, other work, I'm going to go really briefly back to the garden before finishing this section. Um, which was I, I uh, didn't realize that the, the designer of the garden in Aichi, um, Wakui-san, was also the, um, the designer of all the imperial gardens. And so we went around looking at those in, in Kyoto, and it was so astounding to, to me to see uh, nature that had been cultivated in this way, in which every single detail and every single view and every single little petal that fell off was a kind of um, part of a of a plan and a design. And so walking through these um, gardens was... Uh, and, and every single tree, for example, in this grove um, is uh, blooming within like two days of each other. So it just goes... It looks like it's on fire, sort of, like the trees are, are catching fire. It's just so incredibly clever and beautiful. And um, and then these, kind of, and we are having to be there at the m most uh, exquisite time when the cherry blossoms had just come out. And, you know, I mean, is that a postcard or what? Do you, you know, that's a postcard. Um, so um, I think that's, oh yeah. Now, I wanted to show you a couple of um, uh, things, uh, solutions that I've had in terms of trying to invent this this other type of way to tell a story. Um, and uh, I'm going to, I told you that they had to do with animals, so I'm going to show you a couple of, of things. Um, but first, I, I'll tell you, this is from an exhibition that, that's traveling around right now. It's about 15 different big rooms and lots of instruments that I've designed in different ways I've worked with sound. And um, this is, for example, um, uh, let's see, just some views of some of the... Uh, I was going to... I think I'll just kind of skip through this rather quickly. These are different types of things that I've designed to hear things in different ways and see them in different ways. And if that sounds vague, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like really vague. Um, what I'm trying to get to is this um, animatronic parrot that I, I designed. And um, before I tell you about this thing, I want to say that, like, in terms of um, uh, think, trying to invent a new way of like, and not a new way, but a different way of telling stories, I, I realized that um, sometimes I, I think, you know, I have to really struggle to find an original way. And then sometimes I'm just completely brought up short by how I'm part of a tradition that I didn't even understand I was part of. And the example that uh, is, um, I spent some time in Iceland uh, last uh, summer, late last summer, and uh, went out to ride some uh, Icelandic ponies. And these are those ponies with those huge heads and like really fast. You know, like they have this like a fifth gear, and they like their their legs go flying out like this. You know, so so riding those and came back and uh, to the barn, and this guy uh, is we're talking and. He's uh, about horses and this and that, and he's saying, you know, and then I'm going to change this um, this whole big room into like a place for barn dances and square dances. And you look around and go, this is so like 
crummy. No one's ever going to have a, have a barn dance in here. And he's like, but he's like really hopeful, and he's really, um, and uh, then he starts talking about you know what the elves would think about this. And I'm going to elves, you know, what do you? What, oh, and then he went, wait a second, what? this guy's really. Rem I'm f had this giant flashback, and I realized. I know who this is. This is like my uncles. My uncles and my father all had did the same thing. They were like rented horses, and they they had the same totally um, unrealistic idea about renting out this place for hay rides and square dances, and then it was all going to be great. And all hordes of people are going to come, and then then except about things about elves. And I'm and I, and I thought, why is this? And, I, and then I realized, you know that. Who's in Iceland? Who came there first? 982, the Irish. And and uh, who came there next? The marauding Vikings. This is, happens to be my own heritage, half Swedish, half Irish. And I thought, that's where those bullshitters are from, you know? It's like, <laughs> I knew that. I was like, I knew there was something familiar about that. And you think, you know, oh, I'm an artist who tells stories. You know, yeah, right, yeah, okay. <laughs> Or some, let me tell you some elf stories. And, uh, you know, it's like you, you know, it's hard to get away to, from really all of the stuff that that you know you learn from other people. And so, um, anyway, this parrot was um, uh, is part of, was part of an installation, and he uh, there's um, a center in him to, that tells it if if people are within his range. And so the, he has about 60 like beckoning calls, and so if people come too close, he tells them like to back off. And the voice is like this synthetic voice is computer generated, and so obviously it's really easy, you know, to record whatever he says. You just type it in. And anyway, I've always loved this idea of like um, of parrots, and but although the idea of talking animals is so incredibly like creepy, that anyway, I decided to make this. Um, bird after spending a lot of time with my my brother has an African gray and uh, his name is Uncle Bob and he has this vocabulary of about 500 words and it's it's really uncanny to listen to this parrot because you're never sure where the line is between communication and, and just you know babble but his tone is completely exact he sounds exactly precisely like my brother or uh and so he'll carry on these like uh one-way phone conversations that go like um yeah this is chris uh-huh yeah friday would be okay i don't know uh, I don't think, no problem yeah you too take care i'll see you soon okay and then he does a pretty good imitation of that you know the phones disconnect uh, and anyway, I, I'm not really sure what he's actually doing, but um, anyway, in writing things for this animatronic parrot, I, I had a really great time because it was like finding a whole new voice, uh, ways to cut up things, and it was very freeing. And um, so anyway, uh, the... Uh, uh, at first I thought this was some kind of like free form non sequitur method, but after a while it became clear to me that there was another sort of uh, logic at work here, and I, I began to uh, really enjoy these, um, what was going on in this sort of jump cut language. So I'm going to play a couple of minutes of, of um, this, and his beak also moves, I, and I know that parrot speaks, you know, don't move, they don't really have lips. Um, but I made the move because I could make the move. <laughs> now, uh, so there's this kind of keyboard glue to between the jump cut kind of language. Her voice. Her voice was like an old rusty pump that sent the words very, very slowly up a long pipe. And then when they got to her open mouth, the words came out like rusty wire. Wire that had been in the cold clay for a long time. I've been seeing dragons again. Yes, it's true. I don't like giving a nude woman a dollar. It's just my policy. So shoot me. That's just the way I see it. Maybe the batteries are running low. Here. Let me take this pencil out of my mouth. Let's throw another log on the fire. 
and get down to um 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 let's see where was i did you know that birds are the only living dinosaurs it's true and think of all the time we've been flying humans learned to fly only about a hundred years ago and now they're playing golf on the moon now that's progress Step on a crack and you'll break your mother's back. What a saying. There were times when I was walking along and I saw a crack and I was tempted to step on it, but I hesitated because I could almost hear the sirens coming to take my mother to the hospital. Her back broken in several places. Screaming in pain. And when we die, our bodies turn to diamonds. To teacups. Not just to Jack and Carbon. Too many people are taking Prozac. That's what I think. This fake cheery mess that's everywhere now is really getting me done. Beauty in all its forms. Funny how hatred can also be a beautiful thing. When it's as sharp as a knife. As hard as a diamond. Perfect. Now, when you enter the space, as I said, the parrot uh, tries to convince you to come into his room and he's using these various strategies of um, like beckoning and sort of flattery. Say, you look like someone who'd enjoy talking to a plastic bird. Or he'd do like this standard like art world schmoozing, you know, like the, the verbal equivalent of the European greeting, uh, you know, peck on each uh, cheek. Darling, how marvelous to see you. I had no idea you were in town. Or like the simple begging and pleading combined with the, you know, Carney Barker approach. Come in, come on in. Please, 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 please come in. Your fortune one dollar, your fortune one dollar. Or just like the straight ahead moronic approach. Hey, hey, what do you say? Why not visit a parrot today? Or the New York uh, street approach, you know, like super low-key. Smoke. Smoke. Yo, mister. Want some smoke? Come here. Now, uh, just a little background on this particular exhibition. It was originally a group show and uh, five other artists. And it was a kind of competition. And um, the way it started was I got this call and they said, you know, you've been... Uh, nominated for a prize, the Hugo Boss Prize, and, and, and that's the men's suits company, and it's an international prize. And I said, great, and then they called back and they said, and the nominees get to have a show at the Guggenheim, and I said, great, I mean, actually I was in the middle of a lot of projects and I really didn't have time to like put a whole show together like that, and then a little later they called and they said, um, and the winner of, of this uh, competition will get $50,000 and will announce it at the show. And this was sounding like more and more like ominous. And I mean, you know, you, you just show up and then they pin this blue ribbon on one of the other artists. And, and the other ones are, let's, you know, let's face it, they're, they're the losers. And, um, and it's all really public. And, and, and I, like, I don't think of myself as a competitive person, really. And so being in this art contest was, was really a little weird. So anyway, I did get to write some things for the parrot to say about a competition and how art should be judged as well as an idea for consolation prizes for the losers. So here's another minute of the parrot. Welcome to the Guggenheim Museum, Soho. The director's name is Tom Kranz. Now, I haven't actually met Tom. I can't really say that I know Tom personally. I mean, I don't have his home phone number. But I do know that this art contest was his idea. By the way, the winner of this contest will get $50,000 courtesy of the people at Hugo Boss. And by the way, I love their suits. You should probably stop by their showroom sometime. They are really, really excellent suits. Very nice fabrics. Very nice colors. 
They're suits for people with excellent taste. Anyway, the winner gets the money, but what do the losers get? My friend Robert said I should get five sets of steak knives. And when the big winner of this art contest is announced, I can give the sets of knives to all the losers. That way if I lose, I can at least get a nice set of steak knives. I think that's a pretty good idea, but I'm not sure I'll have the time to get them monogrammed. Competition. I love it. It's very, very, very American. I like to know what is best, and what is not as good. Sometimes, artwork is judged by using words. Here's how it works. This picture is worth 1500 words. This one is worth three words. That picture over is worth a paragraph. This picture is priceless. Impossible to say enough about it. That one over there is worthless. It's not even worth one single letter. Damn. 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 The destination disk is full. The hard drive is full. The PPS drive is full. Please check the scratch disk on your hard drive. La di da. La di da. I'm a little teapot short and stout. Tip me over. And pour me out. Did you know that Edgar Allan Poe wrote that sign? It's true. God, I love that sign. And Poe also wrote that story about the raven. What a great story. Really, really great. Very moving. Excellent. I'm going to um, just conclude this part with a, another short story uh, about a um, talking animal, and um, and then we're going to go to the Q and A. So, this is um, a story from uh, the end of the moon, uh, a piece that I wrote um, about NASA, and um, this is uh, how it goes. Um, I live in downtown Manhattan, next to the West Side Highway, right near a major tunnel into the city. And for the last three years, my corner has been a police checkpoint, and there are constant sirens and blockades. And during orange alerts, motorcades of police cars go screaming up the highway as they train for maneuvers. And across the street, hidden at the end of the pier, there's the new FBI headquarters. So lately, I've tried to get out of town as much as possible, and so I've been going on these 10-day walks. Now last spring, I decided to go to the mountains, and the idea was to take a trip with my dog, Lola Bell, and spend some time with her and do a kind of experiment to see if I could learn to talk with her. And I'd heard that rat terriers could understand about 500 words, and I wanted to see which ones they were. Now, terriers are working dogs, and they're all about security, and they're bred to protect borders, and so they do these constant perimeter checks, looking for any suspicious holes or breaks in the walls or little irregularities. So Lola Bell does her rounds around my studio every day, and she also does a bit of herding, so when new people come into the room, she taps them on the knee with her nose to take a running count, and then she trains her eye on the door, keeping track of the motion in and out. But if someone leaves the room, she can't subtract. Let's see, 10 minus one would be... So she has to start counting all over again from the top. So this is like a really time-consuming job. I took Lola Bell to California, up into the northern mountains, to a little isolated cabin near a Zen monastery. And they brought food up from the monastery every few days, but we never actually saw anyone. The bread and the vegetables and the supplies just appeared once in a while near the gate. And so it was an ideal situation for an experiment like this one. It was February, and the mountains were covered with these tiny wildflowers. And every day was so beautiful. We just got up and went out and 
so dazzling and peaceful. Such a huge, tall sky and very thin, pale blue air and hawks circling. So every morning we just headed out and started walking and what happened was more or less beauty got in the way of the experiment. It was just so beautiful up there that I, I forgot about the whole thing, really. It just slipped my mind. Now most days we walked down to the ocean, which took several hours, and we almost never saw anyone on the trails. And so Lola Bell would trot in front of me on the path, checking it out, doing a little surveillance, a little advance work, and for fun sometimes. She would drop back and hide behind a rock, and I would turn around and come running back up the path, calling her name. And she would jump up from behind a rock, like laughing her head off. And then we just keep on going, and just sort of goofing around and checking out plants and lying down and having snacks of carrots. Now occasionally, out of the corner of my eye, I'd see some turkey vultures circling in some very lazy way, way up in the sky. And I didn't think much about it. And then one morning, suddenly, there they were, swooping down right in front of me, and I could smell them before I could see them, this, this wild and super funky draft of air, like somebody's really, really bad breath. And I turned around, and they were dropping down through the air, lowering themselves straight down vertically like helicopters with their claws open, right on top of Lola Bell. And it seemed impossible that they could just hover like that. And then I realized that they were hovering because they were in the middle of changing their plan. This little white thing that had looked like a tiny white bunny from 2,000 feet up was turning out to be just a little too big to grab by the neck. And they were hanging there for a moment, just kind of weighing it, calculating, figuring it out. And then I saw Lola Bell's face. And she had one of these brand new expressions. And first was the realization that she was prey and that these birds had come to kill her. And second was a whole new thought. It was the realization that they can come from the air. I mean, I never thought of that. A whole 180 more degrees than I'm now responsible for. It's not just the stuff down here, the paths, the ocean, the roots, but all of this too. And the rest of the time we were out on the trail, up in the mountains, she just kept looking over her shoulder and trotting along with her head in the air. And she had a whole new gait, really awkward. Her nose, not, not to the ground following the smells, but pointing straight up, sniffing, sampling, scanning the thin sky, like there's something wrong with the air. And I thought, where have I seen this look before? And then I realized it was the same look on the faces of my neighbors in New York in the days right after 9-11, when they suddenly realized, first, that they could come from the air. And second, that it would be that way from now on. It would always be that way. And we had passed through a door. And we would never be going back. We're going to take uh, one minute and then we're going to continue with the question and answers. So, um, and comments, whatever. So, um, uh, maybe you could turn the lights on just a little bit and those of you who need to take off. Uh, and Sure, sure. And we have some uh, a wireless...
So if you would, um, we have a microphone here, or you don't have to use it if you don't uh, uh, want to, but feel free to, to use it. And, and anything that you'd like to bring up, uh, or ask, or mention, or whatever. Hello. <laughs> Woo. Um, I actually um, had the honor of um, being hugged by you uh, <laughs> when you gave me my uh, Mixed Messages Award a couple of months ago. Yeah, congratulations on and, that. Uh, I just wanted to tell you um, really that I've been a fan for a long time and um, that um, today I... I could see how much you'd grown. Like, every single time that I see you, you open your mind to so many other new things. And I, I just love that. And the, the thing that, you know, it's, it's inexpressible really to me how wonderful it is to see you lead us like that. And that it's really very simple. And that's what, what I just came to, that it's all about improvisation because we really don't have any other kind of assurance than that. And that's how you ended, which is marvelous to me. Thanks for making that point about uh, assurance because I, I, that is really interesting to me of, of trying to do things without assurance. You know, really, uh, that you really don't know what it, what it's what is going to be, or or even really why you're doing it. You know, uh, last night uh, we were talking about uh, mostly how uh, some of these the things that I'm working on are working out. Tonight I tried to talk a little bit about what it was, and and towards the end of the week we're going to get to the the why, uh, although. Uh, that that's going to be a really interesting part because I, I know that uh, like a lot of you as artists um, ask yourself this probably pretty often as well you know what are you doing this for why are you bothering to do this what is it, what do you really want from this and that question which is in a way un unanswerable but answerable every time you ask it with another way to you know kind of do things is at least for me, uh, one of the things that I, I find um, indispensable. Because, uh, anyway, so thank you for your comment. Um, one of the things that like um, kind of touched me was the thing that you were talking about walking. And um, it's kind of weird when you first started saying the name of the place in Japan, it sounded very much from like where I'm from, which is IT. And um, we have uh, what we call a gaga which is a walking acoustic band that walks in the mountains for miles and miles and miles and miles. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. And they're incredible. And actually, I'm working on a documentary on them. And they, there is one band here in Brooklyn that is uh, doing this ancient tradition that goes, dates back to the slave days. And I'd like to give you my card. And if you would ever like to I'd check it out. I'd love to find out more um, about that. It sounds fantastic. You know? I mean, but I don't understand, like, the, a walking band. They're playing as they they're walking. They play for miles. Once you start, they start playing. Like, let's say they start playing at the bottom of the mountains. They could walk for two or three days just playing and just stop and rest. And these are horns they're playing. Yeah, these are horns. Cool. And they, they play horns and drums and all the instruments are natural instruments. Uh, so it was like really touching to me. You started talking about the walking, so I just thought to myself, oh no, my that's God. That, that really that's, looks beautiful. That's what, we're, that's what we're doing. Playing as you go. I mean, that, it's like, I, I think we really are uh, nomads. I really think we are. I mean, and it is just kind of temporary that we're sort of stuck here. Uh, but I, I think motion is it seems like something that people really come so naturally to us that um, once we can get a little freer of, of stuff, I mean, that's one of my sort of ridiculous sort of pet theories about where art might be going, is that uh, in a direction in which that 
let's say, you know, like in this theory, we would start at the beginning of the 20th century and say, talk about the things that are being claimed as art, you know, a, a, a urinal going on to earth art, that big pile of dirt is a beautiful work of art. Um, that uh, for playwrights, you know, that boring day, that's a work of art, you know, nothing happens in the play, that's gorgeous, you know. Um, the uh, artist who has affairs with her collector as her artwork, that's art, you know, everything's been pulled into the category of art until finally everything will be in there and we'll be just so tuned to, and then we not, won't need so much these, you know, official places where it's art is kept, you know, as, as if it were money. money. And um, they'll, I think, you know, in this theory, they, that'll be more like art as voodoo, you know, like objects, tchotchkes that taught us how to see beauty and that we won't need them anymore because we'll, we'll be so sharp and everything will be able to, you don't need to make stuff because uh, you'll be so aware of what is going on that you don't need any little things to say, hey, look at it this way, look at it that way. Um, the, uh, uh, also, I mean, I think there should be some little place where like the exquisite things like, you know, a little horse from Turkey made of gold and, you know, so, you know, very beautiful things. But, you know, I, my dream is, is it's probably like a 10,000 year dream, but that, that humans could eventually like completely free themselves of that stuff and that we could, and every single second of our lives would be worth it. You know, we would be just totally awake and not waiting for anything at all. You know, just, and the best example I can think of uh, uh, in, in a way goes like this. I mean, we're, I just think we are so exquisite, you know, like all this stuff that you, you know, say you know or think you know, and then, then times where your hair just stands out in the back of your neck and go, yeah, wow, what, what's going on? I just saw a couple nights ago, pillow, the pillow man, really, you should go see it. it one reason is because one of the actors, Jeff Goldblum, is um, really good in this play. Um, and one of the reasons is because his gestures are sort of like um, divorced from his words in a way. It's not like you stop listening to the words and you and you you begin to see that he's. Thank you for that sound effect. I'm building up to them in this way, and you watch ideas cross his mind, and you kind of. Go, Gesture, right, gesture, not just the words, the bull, you know, which you can often use as just, you know, some kind of defense, you know, language is a defense me mechanism to like, you know, fill the time or, you know, m just for s make it less awkward, you know, to be with someone. But he, uh, or I'm thinking also, I've been reading a lot of uh, uh, Nabokov lately and he has a lot of examples of this way that he pays attention to the physical world and particularly to gesture. There's one character who's always a little in front of her behind the, the, what he's doing. So he reaches out and his hand is already in the shape of a hand that's holding a wine glass. And then he picks up the wine glass, you know, and then he puts it down, it's still a bit, you know, so it's, always, it, it's always like these kind of little ghosts uh, of things that prepare you to, to come in and out of language. Uh, the next uh, comment or? Hi, um, I was really interested in um, what you said about trying to think of a new way to tell stories and the way you equated that with a legacy of bullshitting. And so I, do, you, do you consider yourself a professional bullshitter? And if so, does that inform uh, the way you want to tell stories and do you still want to find a new way of doing that or does that uh, seem to matter to you? Well, I think one of the, uh, 
great uh, things about bullshitting is is the jump cut. So, like, you, if you notice, like, bullshitters are great at jump cuts. They're just going to go from, they're going to do a 180 degree turn from what you thought they were like, to, or, you know, when, you, when you're doing that yourself, you know, that's great fun. And I, I've noticed that um, only a couple places in, in the world have perfected this um, uh, languages. Are from. One, one was, uh, is definitely Dublin, and where they really use language uh, for, you know, to have amazing amount of fun, and, and really as an art form. It's just... Um, and also, I, I love the accent so much. And I, I was recent, I was there, uh, you know, a month ago or so, doing a project, and I was um, giving a talk, and I realized um, that I was because I love the way they're talking. It was starting to come into a little bit of into the way you know I was talking, and I was looking at people, and they were all like really wincing, and they're like, oh. <laughs> Please don't do that, you know. It was like, but I, I almost couldn't help it because it's like so beautiful, and I wanted to be like part of it, you know. So, um, I, anyway, um, there and also, I had the feeling that in Jerusalem they were into this kind of use of the language as just, you know, this very sharp tool. Now I, don't, I have no idea really what they're saying, but just from the way that they were. Uh, uh, engaging each other in that. It seemed like um, a, a, a beautiful game. And as I was saying, I, I appreciate more and more the dynamics of conversation and duet than much more than um, I do the, the thing that just kind of goes, I think I'm going to do, I think, to, you know, to stop. You know, so I, I love the, the push and pull of, of things that uh, uh, have two sides at least. Another thought or comment or question? What language do you dream in? Um, paranoia, for one thing, and uh, you know, uh, dimly lit, you know, sort of a... Uh, I, I dream uh, pretty much, I would say, in pictures. And um, uh, I tr I've tried to, over the last few months, uh, draw, um, I wonder if I have any pictures of this. Hang on a second. Um, uh, what? Uh, the projector's off. I know. Oh, that's okay. It's, it's off for the night. That's okay. I was going to show you some of these, but um, they're uh, super complicated, and people talk in, in balloons, so you don't really hear the language. You hear their, what they might uh, say. And, and I think that's also one of the really interesting things about um, um, translation and simultaneous translation, too, is that when you read something and it comes directly into your mind and, not, and bypassing your ears, uh, there's something very, very magical about that, especially if you read it big. You know, I, I, it's um, an utterly different experience. So I, I and not in, not a um, uh, uh, not a silent movie kind of thing because you you ha it has the texture of you know spoken language. It just doesn't have any sound. And one of the exercises I really like to try to do, to remind myself what an idiot I am, is try to use the, like, the wrong sense for something. Like, let's say, you know, uh, well, the, as the example in the, in the film, in the last words of that film, you know, I think, uh, sometimes I think I can smell light. That kind of thing of like, or forcing yourself to hear something like a cloud passing, let's say, you know. And you realize um, that that part that 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 is utterly impossible, and uh, and it makes you remember that we have, as well as a lot of you know, very um, a lot of tentacles. We also have a lot of limitations, and there are lots and lots of things. I don't know if it's like ninety percent of the universe that we're, that's unavailable to us, but I know that there is um, a lot that our our five or six senses can't quite process. And so those are the, our, our great mysteries, you know. We just don't know how they work, what they, you know, so 
Anyway, let's take like one more uh, question if it's, if it's a simple one and uh, if it's a complicated one. You seem to have a lot of things going on, obviously. I was just wondering if you had any advice about time management or how you manage to <laughs> structure your, yourself. Like, I mean, what is your, I mean, what is your practice in the day when you wake up, you go to the studio and you go, oh, I've got 12 different projects going on and 20 more coming up and, you know, how do you get from A to Z? Um, the, uh, I always think of like uh, that in terms of like some, advice um, our, our, our dog trainer gave us. She said, like, if you, if you want to understand um, your dog, you have to understand, of course, how they would talk. So she said, if you have a German shepherd, you know, you give your German shepherd a command and they go, right, boss, I'm going to get it done. Don't worry about it. Don't even, you know, don't even think about it. It's done. Uh, if you give a command to the poodle, you know, the poodle just goes, you know, just love me because... Uh, I'll do anything for you, just but, but you've got to love me. You've got to just love me. You know what I mean? And, and you give a command to the terrier, and the terrier goes, um, "Is it going to be fun?" Because if it's not going to be fun, then I, I have zero interest in this. You know. So no. So that's my like my template. Is, but it's gotten more complicated, I have to say. So now I have three things, and I and I decide on a, whether to do a project um, based on these three things. And um, it, it only has to be two out of the three. And the first is, is it going to be fun? And the second is, is it going to be interesting? In other words, I'm going to learn something new. And the third is, is there money in it? And you can you can do um, if you do a kind of balance of those, um, then. I, I found that that's a really good um, kind of formula. And then you really can keep making things, because it's really hard to be an artist in the United States of America, so you all know. It's really hard. Um, but also, I think that um, uh, it's uh, the best way to have that experience, I think, is that if, if you um, think of it as, as something to really, really look forward to and just don't think of it as... Uh, work. I mean, I know we call it our work, but um, it's uh, pretty strange to call something that that has that kind of freedom in it. Uh, uh, by that, is there one last thing? Or I, I want to. Hello. Um, Hello. My question is, uh, what would be the best way or the most natural way to to add electronic music to a show that was uh, previously mostly acoustic? <laughs> what would be the best way to do it? Or the right approach to do it in a, the most natural way, I guess. Um, you know, I, I'd be happy to talk to you. Are you going to be in any of these seminars later in the week? Um, maybe. I'm not sure. Yet. Why don't you try to come to one of those? Because that's, that's a really interesting question. But it's, um, and, and one that would be, you know, um, a fairly long conversation, which I would like to have. Because I, I, it's an interesting... But, I, but uh, I'd have to know a lot more about what it was. Um, um, because translating acoustic into... Electronic is a r really challenging thing to do, and a lot of times you lose certain kind of intimacy. A lot of times you gain it too. And, uh, and the the example I'm thinking of mostly is something a project, a recording project that they were doing about flute. They want to record an acoustic flute. This is at um, uh, ZK ZKM, the techno place in uh, Germany. Uh, where is it? Anyway, you prob many of you probably know this place. Um, and I was visiting there, and they were recording a, a flute player. And he was, it was a room about this size, and they had about 150 microphones all over the room. And some were hanging from the ceiling, some were in the corners. And then he himself, the, the flute player, was covered. At, at first I thought, there's roaches all over him. He's covered with... Um, microphones, microphones inside his flute, all over his head, uh, down his arms, 
every perspective of this was being recorded. And then they were making this unbelievable mix that became totally symphonic because all that you heard then was, you know, some parts of this are and others are and others you know, and this was so called simple note of just someone going blowing a note through a little tube um, became when you put headphones on one of the most breathtaking symphonic um, pieces I have ever heard. This mix was unbelievable, and and they would also do great things with the, with the stereo perspective in this piece, so that you, and it, it gave you this feeling of wind rushing in from this side into your head and and hitting the walls around it, and you know then this this sensation. I mean, I, I you know no in some ways, you know, my head feels very, very empty, you know, and this really reinforced that. There's a giant empty room that just felt colossal, like, wow, and it's really, mo and you can feel it moving around, and then it goes out that way, and you're like, it's, it's the most um, kind of breathtaking audio sensation. So this is, is something that's done with them, uh, uh, using, I think, electronics for a, um, to, to take the, a, a very simple acoustic experience and, and do something really interesting with it, with just the sound that's there by changing the perspective. Um, in the violin things that I use, I, uh, those of you who work with MIDI know that um, note, notes translated from you know keyboards into a MIDI system are really clear. Violin, when you play an A flat, it's kind yeah, it's vibrato. It's sort of a. It's sort of a. It's sort of a flat. It's sort of a natural. It sort of goes all over the place. It doesn't go tell you what signal to send. It's a vague thing. It's going like this. So, um, one of the things that I like to do is is use electronics to um, bring up parts of that sound that you kind of hear, but don't really hear very clear. The overtones, the harmonics, so that you bring them up off the noise floor, and they're right there with the note itself. And, and they're all the things that you kind of expect are there and you kind of hear, or if your ear is right next to them, you hear all of those things. Um, and so it, um, it, it gives you again the feeling of, of volume and scale and space. And that's to me what's, what electronics can do to an acoustic sound, you know, without you know, just making up a bunch of things that are supposedly, you know, um, organ, supposedly um, piano, suppo you know, these sort of synth sounds. And the last thing I'll say is um, that a friend of mine who's a musician is teaching his kid to um, play uh, music and through uh, keyboards. And um, the... Uh, he was going through a bunch of the patches on the synth, and it was like, you know, one's an organ, one's, one's a little clavier, one's a, you know, a Rhodes, one's, a, you know, all these different kind of keyboard sounds. And he says, Dad, they, 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 they have so many fonts. <laughs> you know, the people that are coming after us are going to be like really thinking in a different way. So um, let's dedicate this uh, evening to, to them. And uh, thank you very much for coming.